Hi, I'm Matt Gast and lead pastor at First United Methodist Church, Plano. I've had a few folks ask me recently, why are you still wearing a mask if it's not required? Well, truth of the matter is you will have seen several of our staff members wearing masks in some of our public gatherings, including worship. And so I want to answer that question. Uh, all of our staff here at First United Methodist have been vaccinated and we know that we're not a threat to anyone. However, we're also aware that there are still many folks out there who have not yet been vaccinated, especially amongst our youth and children. And we also know that there is a variant out there of the COVID virus that health officials are particularly concerned will affect our youth going into the fall. So we want to signal, and as we have done at every step along the way, we want to do no harm. And so we want to signal to all of those families coming in for the very first time to our church that our staff takes their health very seriously. And we wear these two to encourage all who have not yet been vaccinated, please, for the sake of so many around us, especially our children and youth, get vaccinated. Unless there's an underlying health condition, the service you do to others will be a gift from God. Thank you for your consideration and for your faithfulness. We'll see you Sunday. Good morning, my name is CJ Rice and I'm the minister with youth and their families here at First United Methodist Church Plano. We are so excited that you have chosen this place to worship today. Before we get started with worship, I want to remind you of a couple of things that are going on in the life of our church, some things that we're really excited about in the on the horizon. As Matt announced last week, we have a new schedule coming up starting August 15th. We're calling this a new thing that we're really excited about. So Sunday mornings are going to look a little bit different. At 9 a.m. every Sunday morning starting August 15th, we will have our traditional worship service here in the sanctuary with our choirs, with hymns, and with robes. And then at our 10 o'clock hour, we will have discipleship and fellowship time for all ages. And our 11 o'clock worship hour will be for contemporary worship. Uh, this will be an opportunity for people to experience a new way of worshiping with exciting worship music led by our contemporary worship band. Uh, this bold and exciting thing that is happening, um, it was made by lots of decisions around church leadership, um, about the future of our church, and a, a desire to really reach the people of our community. And we hope that you will come and join us this fall uh, to help welcome new faces into this place and to welcome back old faces that we know and love. Next, uh, if you want to be a part of something that is bigger here at this church, it is a perfect opportunity for you to join the Chancel Choir. Wednesday night weekly in-person rehearsals are going to start this coming Wednesday on July 21st at 7 p.m p.m. in the choir room. If you're interested in that, we want you to contact Robin Kaufman Anderson for more details. And last, we have our long-term sustainability team that has been meeting over the last several months, and their main goal is to find solutions that will move our church into the future um, and to try to reach our mission field as best as possible and utilize our space as best as possible. Um, we have some times that you're able to come up and meet with this team, parts of this team, to find out what their latest recommendations recommendations are in terms of selling the land on our property um, to help continue a bright future for our church. Uh, so that will be happening today at 945, but then also next week for another opportunity at 945 in the parlor. These recommendations that this team has in front of them will be voted on by members of FUMC Plano in a church conference on August 1st. If you'd like to learn more information about any of this, you can visit fumcplano.org forward slash plano planning. With all that exciting stuff to be uh, really excited about for the coming future, uh, we invite you to join us for worship this morning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Seek the grace of God, and my cup runneth over. I seek the will of God, and my cup runneth over. I seek the strength of God, and my cup runneth over. How generous is God's love, so much the world cannot contain it. The Lord is my shepherd, and I lack nothing.
it just a little bit closer today because I want to share a special story with you. And I want you to be able to see the pictures. We're talking about the tie that binds, things that bring us together. And I wanted to read this to you, the invisible string. Now, there's a brother and sister, and they're very scared because there's a storm coming. So they run to their mom. Don't worry, you two. It's just the storm making all that noise. Go back to bed. We want to stay close to you, said Jeremy. We're scared. Mom said, you know, we're always together no matter what. But how can we be together when you're out here and we're in bed, said Lisa. Mom held something right in front of them and said, this is how. Rubbing their sleepy eyes, the twins came closer to see what Mom was holding. I was about your age when my mommy first told me about the invisible string. I don't see a string, said Jeremy. You don't need to see the invisible string. People who love each other are always connected by a very special string made of love. But if you can't see it, how do you know it's there, asked Lisa. Even though you can't see it with your eyes, you can fill it with your heart and know that you are always connected to everyone that you love. When you're at school and you miss me, your love travels all the way along the string until I feel it tug on my heart. And when you tug, right, tug it right back, we feel it in our hearts, said Jeremy. Does, Jas does Jasper have an invisible string, Lisa asked. She sure does, said Mom. And best friends like me and Lucy, asked Lisa. Best friends, too. How far can the string reach? Anywhere and everywhere, Mom said. Would it reach me even if I were a submarine captain, deep in the ocean, asked Jeremy. Yes, Mom said, even there. Or a mountain climber, even there. Even a dancer in France, even there. A jungle explorer, even there. How about an astronaut way out in space? Yes, even there. Then Jeremy quietly asked, can my string reach all the way to Uncle Brian in heaven? Yes, even there. Does the string go away when you're mad at us? Never, said Mom. Love is stronger than anger, and as long as love is in your heart, the string will always be there. And they go back to bed. As they slept, they started dreaming of all the invisible strings they have and all the strings their friends have and their friends have and their friends have until everyone in the world was connected by invisible strings. And deep from inside, they now could clearly see no one is ever alone. Think about your invisible string, your invisible string of love. Who does it connect you to? To your parents, your grandparents, your friends, your schoolmates, your church? Most of all, to God. We may not be able to see that invisible st string, but we know that God always loves us, and we are always connected to God through love. Will you please pray with me? Dear God, thank you for that invisible string of love in my life. Help me to feel the closeness to you and to others as we are all bound together in love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a wonderful and blessed week. Now it's our time uh, to join together in a time of meditation and prayer together. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of life, for the gift of your Son, and for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lead us through the trials, the suffering and sorrow, the challenges and struggles, the tired times and the dark places. Be with those who weep or cannot sleep, who have no peace, who might be seeking release. Lead us with grace, with love, with peace. Fill us with hope, with patience, with stamina. Transform us in your image, in your son, and in your name. Transform us to grow, to understand, to see. Transform us that we can be made whole. And in wholeness, may we be the hands and heart of Jesus. 
And now we join together praying the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All during this pandemic, movies have been few and far between. But last September, a movie was produced that won several awards. It's called Nomad Land. It made its way to some of the screens in January and to Hulu in February. It won the award for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actress. That actress was Frances McDormand. Frances McDormand plays the part of Fern, who has just lost her husband. She and he had worked for U.S. Gibson for many, many years, and the company is closed, so she's lost her job. She has to sell her house, and when she does, she uses what she has to buy an RV. And she decides that she's going to leave Empire, Nevada, and travel from place to place just finding seasonal jobs. As she's leaving Empire, she stops in a store and she sees a friend of hers with a little girl. And the little girl says to her, I'm sorry you lost your house. And Fern says, yes, I lost my house, but I still have my home. Her home was her RV, and even though she didn't know it, her friends and her neighbors would be those nomads that she met along the way. In this movie, the, it looks like week four of our six-week series. To me, it does, much of what happens. Because we're looking in our fourth week of Ties That Bind, at a man who is, has faults, but he also has triumphs. We're looking at David. And in today's passage, he still has not figured out the difference between a house and a home. Let's look at that scripture. This is from Second Samuel. Now, when the king was settled in his house... And the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. The king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving around in a tent in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel when I commanded to shepherd my people in Israel, saying, Why haven't you built the house of cedar? Now therefore... You shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people of Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers will afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of the kingdom forever. 
I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy God, may we trust that in our wandering and in our building, your love that unites us and binds us by that invisible string, even when we're apart, will be the tie that binds. In Christ's name, amen. In the passage we just read, David seems to have it all. He does have a house of cedar. The political regime is in Jerusalem, and he's head of that. The religious center is now in Jerusalem, and he's looking around, and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, something's wrong with this. God, that is the Ark of the Covenant, is still in a tent. Hear what he says again here at verse 5. The Lord said, tell David this. Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I haven't lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel. But I've been moving around in a tent. Wherever I've moved about among all the people, did I ever speak a word with any of them saying, why haven't you built me a house of cedar? So right there, the Lord is rebuking David, asking him, why in the world do you think I would ask you to build a house of cedar or want you to build a house of cedar? And then he goes on and says something very ironic in verse 11. Moreover, he says, I declare to you that I will make you a house. I mean, he already has a house. So what is it that God is talking about here when he says, I will make you a house. He's talking about relationships. As we go on, we see that. I will establish for you and for your ancestors and raise up your offspring after you. And from your offspring will come the one who will build my house. Right now, work on your relationship, he says. And as I read this passage over and over, I thought about the relationships that we have. What relationship have you developed or paid special attention to that has a lot of meaning for you? I mean, maybe it's a relationship here in this church uh, that you've worked on, and it has special meaning for you. For me, I have one that comes to mind, and that is Sandra Aikens, who... Uh, was here when I first came here in 1997. She walked into my office, graceful and elegant as usual, and she said, I would like to talk to you about a dream that some counselors and I have, and it's called Journey of Hope. And we as counselors have seen so many children hurt by the loss of their siblings or their parents. We want to establish a community for them that will bind them together as a family and then bind them together as a community. So they'll have their individual counselors and then once a month they'll come and all bring dinner and share at different tables and the children will find out from the other children at their table that they too sustained a loss. They lost a sibling. They lost a parent. And then Sandra went on to develop this dream with other counselors. It, it's still going today, Journey of Hope. But she also did a lot more than that. She served as leader of many uh, teams around here at First Methodist. And we kept in touch from 2002 until I returned in 2019. She'd send a little text, play a game. And when I came back, she was much more fragile, frail, and soon found out that her husband was fighting a terminal illness. She still ministered in her own way to me, to, to many of us. When her husband died, she uh, was relocated here to dependent living. Her children had offered her to come live with them. She said no. 
my church is so important, the ties that bind me to them keep me here. So they placed her really close to this church in Allen. And things were fine. We had visits. We had phone conversations. We'd remind her to charge her phone. And we could go in and out. And she would come to church every Sunday with some friend that brought her. And then the pandemic happened. Pandemic happened. Everything was closed. No one could go visit. We were not allowed. Her phone would often remain uncharged because there was no one to remind her that we're trying to reach you and we can't get you. And we learned, I think, the hard way from her family that something that was so important to her was, yes, she got some cards and some notes from friends, but what she really, really wanted and loved would be something that said, First United Methodist Church, Plano. And it was from that experience with Sandra that we developed that part of the extended care plan. We developed it this spring where if you're independent living and you're isolated, you're homebound, and you have no family close to you, then we make sure, there's a long list that Connie Amox went through, we make sure that you get a card that says First United Methodist Church Plano and it is signed by all of our staff members. That's for your birthday and this Christmas. Everybody on that list will get a card that says First United Methodist Plano. So where is it that you can nurture a relationship in this community? Because believe me, there's always that need for relationships that need nurturing. That doesn't mean that building something, house of God, is not important. That's how lots of art and architecture has come about because people want to pay tribute to God by building something. It was the right thing to do for First United Methodist Church to build it was the right thing 174 years ago for First United Methodist Church to meet Sunday after Sunday in a classroom in the home of the Russells for nine years. It was the right thing for First United Methodist Church Plano to move to the Spring Creek Schoolhouse and meet there for 18 years. It was the right thing to move and meet 20 more years on Avenue I and then to build on Avenue K where we stayed for the longest for 74 years we stayed there but in 1965 in the 71st year there the church decided we need to to build a bigger church and we need to look for plans which they found and a piece of property which they found and bought and in three years, they moved the church from Avenue K to 18th Street, the fifth move. And yes, we are a bunch of nomads, for sure. The fifth move of a church, of a physical location. That move is the most like the description of moving the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem of any church I've ever seen. It's almost word for word because last week, if you remember, Matt read it to us <clears throat> and it said David was dancing, there were tambourines playing, there were all kinds of musical instruments as they took the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem. Well, let me tell you what happened when we were in that move. In 1968, I wasn't there, but I know it from a very good historian of the church, Shirley Shell. She described it to me. So, all the members of the church went in and got treasures from the old church, lined up to march in a parade over to the new church on foot, yes. And not only were they marching over to the new church with their treasures, they were led by police escort and the Plano High School band. That's what that move looked like to 18th Street. 
I came here in, for the first time in 1997 on 18th Street at that location. And in the year 2000, our, our uh, long-range committee was looking at some possibilities, but nobody was looking at, or far, 30 acres. And suddenly, I remember, because my office was right next to the senior pastor, I remember how excited people were getting, like, can you believe there's this piece of property that's almost 30 acres, that's only $1.2 million, maybe a little over? That's unheard of. I think there's some kind of sign for us. And I'm sure some of you have heard the stories of those signs where we went over to the property and rainbows would appear while we were there. And we put a cross there finally when we bought the property. But, you know, I kept thinking, 30 acres, what are we going to do with 30 acres? And I think the yard birds were thinking that too because they were mowing every Friday. But they were mowing a little less than six acres. So you moved to 30 acres. And I remember... What are they going to do? How are they going to do it? Probably have to hire people for sure. In 2002, the year we moved here, my last year here that time, it was Easter. And it was dark, and we were having the Easter sunrise service, and it was drizzling. And we didn't walk because it was a long way, but we did drive in the dark over here to 3160 Spring Creek Parkway, and we quietly got out. And the thing that was standing was all the concrete and all the rafters outside and inside, but no wall or roof yet. And under those rafters, we had our Easter sunrise service, even in the rain. That year in December, I was gone, but you all moved to this location. It was the right thing to do to build at that time. So now, as many of you know, we're thinking about selling some of these acres, just some of them, just enough that would reduce, uh, let's see, it would reduce the workload from three times what the Yardbirds were doing at uh, Avenue K or 18th Street to um, from five times to three times as much. So we still are talking about a lot of acreage, but I began to ask myself, so, what are the opportunities there? And immediately, we know from those little cottages, the possibilities will be, we have a mission field. We can be and will be Christ to our friends and our neighbors, our new friends, our new neighbors. In that movie, Nomadland, Francis McDermott, during that whole time, the filming was going on, almost every nomad in the film is a real nomad. Bob Wells, Swanky, Linda, and now Francis McDermott's circle has widened in friends because those people, those nomads that she filmed with for all that time are truly her friends. We're a bunch of nomads. We truly are. And God says to us nomads, don't worry so much about building a house for me let me build a buy it, that's B-A-Y-I-T, let me build a buy it for you. The thing about a buy it is it has no boundaries really. It's just this force, this string, this invisible string of God's love that binds people together and calls them to be leaders, breathing, moving body of a community of Christ held by that invisible string of God's love so that even those times when we're separated, like the pandemic separated us, when we're alone and isolated, we're not alone. We're part of that community of God's love. That's the good news. May we believe it and may we live it. Amen. About two months ago, we were all on a staff retreat, and we'd come back, and we were busy, and we had other things that we were doing, and we were committed to meetings, and I am with pastoral care, but I had these obligations, and I ran into one of our members, and she was really busy, and she had a list of a few questions she was asking me. Um, she just wanted to know, 
where do we usually tell a person to go when they're trying to complete their paperwork to get into housing? And all these questions. And I said, do you need my help? And she said, I'm okay. I just need to know the answers to these questions. And there was a family of six. And one of them was a very challenged uh, teenager with them. But these people had done all the work that they knew to do and could do. They just needed some help. And before I knew it, by the time I got out of my next meeting, I came out. And this woman, one of our members, had not only completed that paperwork with them, showing them how to do that, but had received word that they would get in that apartment in two weeks like they wanted to. And the next thing I knew, without her telling me, but someone else telling me, she had sent a load of, of, veg, of uh, groceries to their new place to surprise them because she knew the address. She'd helped them get in it. And there, when they came to the front door, they were going to find all those groceries inside their living room. She had made that happen. Thank you so much for continuing to find ways to welcome people home. <laughs>
receive now this benediction. As you go from this place to wander or to build, may you find yourselves tethered to that invisible string of God's love, even when we're apart. Go with God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you.